this service this morning. At First Christian Church of Decatur, I'm just so glad to see everybody here this morning. I'm glad to see everybody here physically. I'm glad to, for all of you who are joining in virtually. I'm happy for everyone who's come wherever you've come. Uh, I know myself, I came from a little bit of a distance this, because I, last night I just got off a plane from Phoenix. So um, wherever you come from, wherever you are, know that you are welcome here. And know that we are an open and affirming church, which means that everyone is welcome. And we mean this very seriously. Because even in our statement, we talk about that we you know, actively strive to honor each other's race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, nationality, ethnicity, marital status, physical or mental ability, family configuration, political affiliation, economic circumstance, or theological perspective. We truly do welcome all. We're glad for each and every one of you who are here. Um, so first, I'm just also appreciative of all the people who are involved in worship today. For those of you who don't know me, I am Jennifer Hassler, and I'm just so glad to be, be involved today. Um, assisting with us also, um, you just heard the wonderful music by Kathy Westbrook, uh, and she will have all of that throughout. William Gardner will be doing, uh, orchestrating all the music as well as orchestrating everything behind the scenes. So for those of you who are virtual, you don't actually get to see him much, but he does an amazing sort of thing. Um, they, so Reverend Kaylee Hargrove will also be presiding at the table. Um, and other, other aspects as well as also kind of keeps the electronics running, so she deserves credit for that. And also our elder also presiding and reading scripture is Barbara Powell. Um, just very happy for everyone being here. Um, I also know that we have one other announcement that there is coming from the Women's Ministry Gathering for Overcoming Trauma. Um, this is going to be a virtual event for anyone who's kind of been, who's kind of been, um, dealing with various forms of trauma, whether that be you know, verbal or physical abuse or divorce or any other sort of issues that may come up. Um, I'm not sure I have an actual date, Kaylee, because it said some, I think the date on, that you gave here may or may not be there, but do you know when the date was? Okay, so we will follow up with that, but know that this is a resource that's, that's coming and I think it's gonna be a very valuable one for those who've been through trauma or have had to live through trauma, having that, having someone to walk with you or having community to walk with you is so important and we're glad to be that community here. So with that, let us continue worship and we'll continue worship with, with, our, with our opening hymn.
Will you join me in the call to worship? If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. God, may we grow to see you in all people. May we open our hearts to the risen Christ. Jesus, may we see your reflection in all people called to serve you. And now the unison prayer of invocation. May we proclaim the good news to all people. Forgive our lack of trust in your spirit, moving through all people and calling all people in this mission. Grant us your grace as well as open our eyes and hearts to empower everyone whom you call. Give everyone you call the strength to preserve, the courage to speak out, and the faith to walk humbly with you. Good morning. Our scripture this morning, the first one is from Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Our second scripture comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? 
Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for that wonderful music. Like that. It is good to be it's good to be here with you today. Just I am so thankful to be here. So if we were look looking at in the ancient world and trying to and particularly thinking in the Greco-Roman world, 
And if you wanted to actually have a person speak for your organization to give a good impression, you would likely have an affluent and well-connected male person to be that representative. One would never plan for the primary story of any new movement to be told by women. Just wouldn't. You know, if you think about it, the testimony of a woman was, was considered less than a man in, that, in those days. Um, in fact, today we see remnants of these issues today where there's even places you know, and, and cultures in the world today where the testimony of a woman is, is half or less than half of a man. So we can see where that, see that there comes from. Women were considered gentler, soft stuff, and men were better, hard stuff. And you can kind of see the, um, the, the sort of need for protection and stability that came out of that. So if you wanted credibility, you would look for and find as well respect and affluent and well, you know, affluent and well-educated person you could find, and that would be somebody male. And yet here's the thing, when we actually look at scripture, what we see is we see women leading in all sorts of key places throughout the early community and the early church. You know, even if the letters and stories that as they came to us were trying to be, you know, careful to a more male-centric sort of space in this Jewish and Greco-Roman space, they just found no way to be able to tell the story without mentioning all of the women and the important women and the leaders in this. And I think this, this says a whole lot. Now, we heard a few weeks ago about Phoebe, a later from sort of the greater Corinthian church, who was involved in, in the writing as well as carried and read aloud the letter of Romans with Paul's authority. You know, we also have heard about Tabitha, who was from, from Joppa, and just sort of her sort of story. One can find a whole number of women who had key ministry and leadership within the early church. And this is an important thing for us to, to notice. And yet, and yet, among all of this, the greatest of all of these women that we end up seeing in the New Testament tradition is a woman named Mary. Mary from, uh, from, from, from Mag Magdala. There are several important women, by the way, named Mary in the New Testament. Okay, so, um, you know, for example, there was a Mary from Bethany who anointed Jesus with perfume, and you might remember that story. That was also a Mary. There's many different Marys, and it's okay if you get confused with everyone who's named Mary. After all, you know, the sixth century Pope, Pope Gregory the Great, you know, did as well. It was basically from a sermon that we actually get this sort of incorrect story of Mary, Mary, Mary that also known as Mary Magdalene, who, you know, was a prostitute and all of the related stories to that. By the way, the Catholic Church did, you know, a few years later declare that Mary Magdalene wasn't the penitent sinner and prostitute. A few years later, in 1969. Okay, it took him a little while. Um, oh, well. So it's okay if you're confused. You know, there's a lot there, right? Um, so Mary was from a, was from a city that uh, was on the Sea of Galilee. Okay, the full name of the town actually means Tower of Salted Fish. So it clearly was an important area of trade and commerce uh, right along the Sea of Galilee. And being on the Sea of Galilee, it's not surprising that Mary would have heard of Jesus at this time frame. You know, Luke also re reports that Jesus sent out seven demons from Mary. Exactly what this means, kind of hard to tell, other than, you know, having a miraculous healing connected to Mary, connecting Mary to Jesus. But what we do know, and probably the important part of this, is that Mary was one of the core followers of Jesus, being part of a group of women who actually funded the ministry. Now remember that in, in this time, women did own property, did have resources, and in fact were very much the core people behind actually funding Jesus' ministry and the early church's ministry. Um, we can kind of see this in, in Luke's Gospel and I'll, in sort of the first three verses in chapter eight. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called, called Magdalene, who, was, who, had from, who from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, 
the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So we definitely see this sort of, sort of funding and helping the group. But notice that the core, dr core group of disciples, and I read it as Luke talks about this, is not just the 12 disciples as we think of male disciples, but it was those who we know as the apostles, but at least three female disciples, but it says many more. And you, you look at it and you see a couple key people. Joanna, which by the way was a very key person of influence because her husband was the manager of Herod's household. This is kind of Herod being of the, of the region in Galilee. So it was Herod, who was a son of Herod the Great. So had a lot of influence, influence in the Galilean region and, and likely had some in, you know, allowance for Jesus to move freely through that space. By the way, some also tend to think Joanna may be the same person as Junia. There's sort of a connection between the names, the apostle mentioned in the Romans letter. So there are some interesting arguments, it's somewhat speculative, but it's an interesting conversation and picture to do that. So it's really quite interesting, but what really focuses, at least in the gospel accounts, is that Mary is central to sort of the, sort of the resurrection, the, the final passion resurrection story of Jesus. She's in all four resurrection accounts, specifically by name, and plays a significant role in all of these stories. In particular, when the fourth, you know, when you bring all four of the gospel accounts together, you kind of get the sense that Mary was kind of the first person to kind of see the risen Jesus and the first to testify to his resurrection, and sort of the, and also the leader among the women for sure, and maybe more. Um, you know, and it's interesting, right? Because there's no doubt that Mary heard Jesus talk about his resurrection because Jesus talked about it to his core group of disciples. And if you start to th realize that core group of disciples wasn't just 12 men, but was also the other women with them, you begin to go, oh, okay, so something is going on here. So the other women who went to the tomb would have looked at this. She stayed with the cross, you know, with multiple of these notable women. It was present during his burial. You know, if you think about it, she might have thought something could happen during these moments, maybe. She'd heard Jesus say it, and she probably was hoping that. And, of course, they left Jesus in the tomb when the Sabbath started. And I'm sure she's thinking to herself, it's got to be just, you know, it's got to be crazy to think somebody would rise from the dead. And yet she was hoping maybe there was a chance, because she'd heard Jesus talk about it. Maybe. And if she went to the tomb early that Sunday morning, who knows, right? Maybe something. And Mary and the other women arrive at the tomb on Sunday morning. And the stone was rolled away. Different counts, slightly different, but basically we, well, that's kind of the case. And Jesus' body was not there. But here was what's interesting if you do a careful reading. You notice that everything was sort of neatly folded up, right? Now, if you were someone trying to take the body away quickly, that's not what you would do, right? If you were a grave robber, you would just grab the body, and who cares what was left over? That's not what happened. It doesn't look like this was a hurried job. You wouldn't actually leave all the cloth there. So something's going on. And so, the, but yet the question is, well, what does this mean, right? You, you, if you were to see this, you're like, well, what do I do with this? And then of course in Mark, you know, an angel appears to these women, which is kind of interesting because you end up seeing the angels primarily showing up to the women. And of course, you know your day is interesting if you ever see an angel. I haven't had that experience yet, but uh, I, I imagine that would be rather, rather, uh, rather startling. And then after that, so along the what the angel says, Mary Magdalene and the others find their way to Peter and John. And what you see is that the women were the first to report the earth, the empty tomb, to the rest of the disciples. And again, we're not entirely sure what John and Peter are hearing. They hear Mary's worried about that Jesus' body is not there. They also hear that Mary and other women have a sense that something might have happened and something about an angel. Um, you know, and so there's this question and confusion, right? You know, maybe what Jesus told them about the resurrection happened, but maybe not. I mean, like, what is all, you know, you can see all this. And so Peter and John, not sure what to do, they race to the tomb. I'm sure Mary 
clearly came along because she was she was in the, in the later part of the story she heard the scripture I always find it interesting that John made a very clear point that although the two of them ran John showed up first the competitiveness is rather amusing um, I, I think that's actually one of the reasons, um, you know, that's almost sibling um, rivalry, which I think is one of the reasons that my, my older daughter finds the book of John one of her favorite books. Uh, always loves this. But they get, they get to the empty tomb and they see something happened. They see what's going on and then they kind of leave puzzled going, all right, I'm not sure what to make of this. Okay. And you, you know, and let's be fair, right? You, you got to give the male and female disciples a bit of grace on this one, because even if somebody said to you, you know, that they were going to be resurrected, you believed them, and then after three days you found their coffin empty, and you talked with an angel, your brain might be still having a hard time figuring this thing out, right? It's just not what you're used to seeing. So, but here's the thing, Mary stays behind the tomb after John and Peter leave. She, there's still some, some sense of things there. She's not quite sure what to do with it at this point. Well, she ends up seeing two more angels. And they're like sitting inside the tomb, kind of hanging out. And, you know, you're thinking, okay, this is going to be a fun day. This is going to be real interesting. And Jesus, Jesus himself just sort of, you know, comes up to her, you know, behind her. And she doesn't quite recognize him, maybe thinks... Hey, you know, someone, you know, in the gardener, kind of trying to figure this out, someone working around the tombs. Maybe he knew something. Maybe she could find out something. And then Jesus spoke to her. Mary. She knew that voice. She knew that familiar voice calling her name. She knew that voice calling her name better than anyone. Her eyes were opened. The, the unexpected actually happened. It was Jesus actually, actually there in front of her, now very much like he was in life, but now resurrected and transformed, not just resuscitated, but something more. Any surprise? She was completely overwhelmed. Could you imagine anything? Could you imagine anything else? Uh, to her words that she would eventually tell the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Can you just imagine that? And yes, the, the remaining verses have a lot of mystery around them, what's actually going on, and that, that would take a longer sort of uh, theological discourse. What's clear is she was the first to see Jesus resurrected. She became the first to, to witness the resurrected Jesus and the first to witness the, you know, this, this wonderful opportunity to the other male and female disciples. And you think about it, this is not a res this is just not a resurrection account that you would have ever anyone would have ever constructed or anyone have suggested. Which by the way leads to the fact that of its authenticity. The gospel account written written this way is probably because for a very simple fact, everybody in the community for multiple generations knew the story. You couldn't say anything different. And to have told, come up with a different story, even if you wanted to, like, you know, make it sound better to a Greco-Roman audience, nobody would have allowed that, because everyone knew Mary stating, I have seen the Lord, first to the male and female apostles, and then probably to others later in Pentecost and going beyond. It's an interesting question, by the way. Uh, scholars talk about this a bit of, you know, how close was Jesus with this Mary? Um, it's really kind of hard to tell, uh, to be honest. But it's what's very clear among all of the sources is that Mary clearly had a very close connection with Jesus and arguably would have been one of his primary disciples, male or female, in this situation. We do get some intriguing perspectives from, from other sort of, out, sort of extra canonical writings of the time, you know, things that didn't make it into the canon but were still had some uh, importance within the early community. And it's clear in all these writings that Mary had a special connection. In fact, one document went so far as to imply that there could have even have been a romantic relationship. People like to expound on that. Uh, but it's an interesting thing in the older manuscripts. It seems like certain key words were written, were uh, eaten through by ants. All I have to say is God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Uh, 
But what is also interesting, and it's important to kind of get a sense of it, is that even within the early New Testament church, you could see that Mary had some positive interactions with some, some of the apostles and disciples, like Levi, Matthew, or some difficult interactions with others, like Peter. So clearly there was some sort of struggle between understanding how do we bring, you know, how do we bring the male and female disciples together and how does this all work? And clearly that friction was known within the community, even though it seems like without a careful reading, you don't notice this stuff underneath the surface. And it's important for us to be aware of this because I think, you know, we, we tend to have some certain idealistic views and I think this helps change a little bit of how we're seeing it. But what is clear in every single case is that Jesus defends Mary. You know, and Mary is, defends Mary as being an important leader among the apostles. And by the way, sometimes implying that maybe she's the most important leader. Where this goes, hard to say. But very relevant of her, of the relevant there. And that she was important among the leadership of the early Christian community. Both men and women. And I find this interesting, right? Because I wonder how different this perspective sounds from this biblical account, just reading the text, just what comes through this. And sort of this picture we get out of the New Testament church and how it sounds to us today. You know, whether we were raised in the church or never been a part of the church, it probably sounds a bit different than we're used to. I wonder if we kind of understood that women were among the leadership of the entire New Testament community, how that would transform our understanding of the movement of the church today. We believe that we understand the early church and we have this sort of ideal version, ideal vision, version approach of the early church. And yet this picture is different and wider than we, could, than we would have expected. Remember what we've heard in other places in scripture, the early Christians were known for their radical inclusiveness. Jesus was known for his radical inclusiveness. Rich and poor, free and slaves. Why would you have a movement of slaves? That's gonna get you nowhere, right? Well, it kind of worked. Women and men. Why would you have a group of women? And yet, that seems to be so key. But to the Greco-Roman mindset, it made no sense. Jews and Gentiles, all were part of this community. And all were called to lead others in making disciples. And, you know, if we follow this egalitarian perspective in the New Testament church, you know, should we not also be raising up leaders of all people? today? Should we not think twice when we put limitations on other groups of people, you know, today whom God and Christ call to us today? I mean, I know it's very common within sort of the core of the primate brain for to have a hierarchy and for us to identify with those who are in our group and various parts of that and then identify those outside of it. It's very much part of our biology. And then to identify those who are leaders and those who are not. And yet, you know, it, it, and yet Jesus calls us to something very different, right? You know, Jesus, in the end, Jesus calls us to make disciples of all nations. You know, all means all, and all means we need everyone. And, and be very careful here. Know that the very people that you are thinking and are inclined to restrict from the community are the ones God has also called and loves and wants in ministry. And none of us are immune from this. Mag Mary Magdalene would have understood this call, and she did, and, and, and the need for everyone to be part of this call. I think the early community Christian church would have gotten it. And the need for people everywhere to proclaim as she did I have seen the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
So every week we come to this table and sometimes I wonder and like to think through why we actually come to this table every single week. Because whenever I read the Bible, there, there's nothing in it that says, hey, uh, take part in this meal every single week. We just have Jesus who says, each time you do this, you know, think of me. But we don't know what this is. When he said that, it was during the, the Passover festival and this, this meal that, that they took part in every single year. So did Jesus mean whenever you do, the, do this Sabbath meal, do you think of me? There's just really not too much there. We find out in Acts and in, the, uh, in Paul's letters that the early church did in fact have, the, have this meal uh, rather regularly, possibly every week in different locations. Paul even hurried up a trip so he could make it for the meal in the book of Acts. So the origins of this meal is really kind of, it's kind of a mystery. We don't really know, but the early church started doing it. And because of that, they started a tradition. Unfortunately, or I don't know, maybe unfortunately isn't quite the word, but the tendency for humanity, like Jennifer just spoke about, was to, uh, is to look for a hierarchy and look for kind of separation between people. And this table kind of became something a little bit more. This table became that, uh, that gate for which somebody is part of the kingdom or isn't. And that became this use of more political power of who can come to the table and who can't. If you can't come to the table, then you're not part of the church, you're not part of the kingdom, bad things happen. So there was this point where this table, the restriction of this table was something that was used to control people. And I just think about that, like how this table can become something where we are separating from each other, where we are developing these hierarchies, where we restrict others from knowing God. And that's why I think it's so important that we are intentional about what we do with this table and how we speak about it and how we come to it. Our church denomination, we choose to do this weekly because that's how, honestly, it's because that's how the people who started this movement understood the table to be celebrated in the early church is weekly. Not every denomination celebrates weekly, but we do. And I'm happy that we do because uh, I'd like to take part of that tradition. But in doing it weekly, we have to understand the importance of what that means and what it means that this table is not ours to restrict. We have almost 2,000 years of history of trying to define who gets to come and who doesn't. But that's not actually our call. Our call is to set it because it's not our table. Our call is to show up because we're invited, but it's not our call to check the invitations. And everyone, if we did check the invitations, would have one. And so when we come to this table, reminded, as Jennifer just spoke about, that being part of this kingdom, being part of this movement, means that everyone is going to be included. We don't get to make the decision of who gets to come and who doesn't. The story of Christianity is the story of 
lifting those who were not supposed to be leaders, were not supposed to be the ones bringing the message, but they were. The book of John, the very first person to preach about the Messiah is a Samaritan woman. She's not, uh, in the minds of the Jewish people, she's not even a full Jewish person. She's a Samaritan. There's an entire history behind those two groups. And so that's what this table means. And that's one of the reasons I think it's important to celebrate it each week. It's because Christianity is not about who we think should be in. It's about the fact that God loves all people and has invited all people to be in it. Let's pray. Dear God, we ask you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to bless this communion and all the souls of those who will partake of it. Amen. For we see from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup, after dinner, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now the unison prayer of commission. God, our help, we thank you for the supper, shared in the spirit with your son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him, and pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. And now the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
it is such a blessing that when we look at the New Testament church, we see that of just everybody being included, everyone being there to, to move this beloved community forward. It's, an, it's just amazing to watch. And we're just thankful for that, calling each person to move the beloved community forward. So go and be the hands and feet of Christ wherever you may go, and that all people may hopefully say at one point, I have seen the Lord. Amen.